Hello, you're about to listen to a radio program provided by the Limestone Church of Christ, located in Kingston, Ontario. Please feel free to check us out on the web at lookingunterjesus.net. Hello and welcome to our program today. My name is Tom Rainwater and I have with me a special guest, Dr. Don Patton, who is a geologist from Dallas, Texas. And this is the second in a series of three programs with Dr. Patton about creation versus evolution. We're glad to have you here, Dr. Patton. Thank you, Tom. Good to be here. Today we want to ask this question. Did dinosaurs and humans exist at the same time? Because evolutionists will say that the dinosaurs came first, and then a long time later, after the dinosaurs became extinct, then humans came along. I know that you've done some work in Central America, South America, and Texas. What did you find having to do with dinosaurs and humans? Well, I think there's a tremendous amount of evidence from history and from paleontology that demonstrates the coexistence of humans and dinosaurs. Of course, the evolutionist thinks that's nonsense. They had to be millions of years apart for evolution to be true. And we'll acknowledge that if you find that, it would totally destroy evolution as it's being taught in the schools today, certainly, uh, as represented in the geologic column. A 65-million-year mistake is, (laughs) is overwhelming. And so they just tell you that this is the way it is. And you pick up the little golden books even that describe dinosaurs. And millions and millions of years ago, and long before man, no man ever saw this. And what proof do they offer? Do you ever think about that? (laughs) It's just asserted. If you do find them together, then you know there are significant problems with evolution as presented in the textbooks. But we find abundant evidence of that, and I do a lot of lecturing on college campuses uh, all across the country. If you think for a moment, you do find dragons uh, described in all societies in the world, not just the Chinese, but in virtually every society in the world, people talk about and describe and draw pictures of dragons. Now, what does that look like? (laughs) And why do they all have that concept? Interestingly, Carl Sagan made that observation and acknowledge that virtually all societies do have their dragons. And he says, yes, they look basically like dinosaurs. And his explanation was that the shrews were the mammals that lived at the same time as the dinosaurs. And so we must have inherited the fear that was instilled in these shrews, the the concept, the the image of the dinosaur from the shrews 65 million years ago. I'd like to inherit the memory of my father. (laughs) But a shrew 65 million years ago is is a bit of a reach, I think. But at least he's trying to accommodate and and to explain this phenomenon of why everybody has this concept. And uh, I think the best explanation is there's uh, a common history. Right. So they wouldn't know about it unless they saw it. Exactly. And then you see it in all of these different cultures all over the world. And some of the things that we see in these cultures are very specific, like out west, you have petroglyphs drawn by the Anasazi Indians, the Fremont Indians, that are identical to the species of dinosaurs that we see restored today from the bones. They didn't draw bones, they drew the critter, like the Brontosaurus, or like the Triceratops, or like the Allosaurus that we see in Utah and in Colorado, in New Mexico. I was talking to the curator of the Price Museum of Natural History out in Price, Utah, and he had He acknowledged, yes, he had seen several examples of this from the petroglyphs from the Anasazi, who disappeared 1200 A.D., roughly. We're supposed to have known what dinosaurs looked like for uh, almost 200 years, and then gone 65 million. So what were the Indians a thousand years ago doing drawing pictures of dinosaurs? And he said, well, maybe they were smoking some of this crazy Paiute stuff and dreamed up the dinosaurs. (laughs) Well, maybe a 65-million-year-old dream is incredible to some. I didn't buy that. It looks to me like they were seeing the specific dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. When you go down to Mexico, for example, in Acombro, where we've done a good bit of work, we've made uh, about six trips down there now, there's a collection of 33,000 ceramic figurines from this culture, and they date at about 2500 B.C., Uh, so over 4,000 years ago very ancient culture, and they they show a wide range of animals, many we recognize, and of these over 30,000 figurines of people and some rather strange creatures, about 10% of them are of dinosaurs, and some of them very, very specific. The Veronosaurus, uh, particularly, 
but Triceratops, Stegosaurus, uh, even the pterosaurs are represented in these figurines that are thousands of years old, that are dug up with pottery in the museums that uh, have no question about what the date is. And thermoluminescent dating for a few thousand years is fairly reasonable, uh, especially with pottery. And we've done dozens of examples. Uh, also done some carbon dating with some of the straw and material that uh, is found in the pottery. And there is a range from about 1,500 to about 4,000 with the radiocarbon dates. These people were obviously seeing dinosaurs. Uh, there's no other way to explain that. Interestingly, Earl Stanley Gardner got involved in this mystery and uh, wrote a book about it. Uh, this was back in the late 50s, early 60s. And even then, they did some radiocarbon dating and uh, came out with similar results. He was trying to meet the objection that the discoverer of this culture, Yildred, who had uh, immigrated from Germany in the early 1900s, had actually manufactured these things, 33,000 of them. <laughs> and he found fragments of these creatures in the adobe brick that dated uh, over 50 years before Yildred arrived from Germany. Uh, oh. He devised various tests. Now, of course, Earl Stanley Gardner is the author of Perry Mason, and he's a, a very famous detective. He was a very famous practicing attorney and a criminologist uh, from California, Ventura, California, before he began to make his living writing scripts for TV and, and radio and writing books. But his book, The Host of the Big Hat, is the one where he describes this phenomenon and devised these tests to verify the concept that Yules Rudd may have manufactured these and uh, excavated under roads and under stone walls that knew had been there for hundreds of years and found fragments of these pieces everywhere. He says it's absolutely impossible that they could have been planted or manufactured by Yuletrud. So that's one example that would demonstrate from history. Likewise, down in Peru, where we've made several trips, and uh, uh, we have thousands of examples of the burial stones from the Inca tombs of these uh, stones with uh, pictures carved on them. Dr. Cabrera has a collection of over 11,000 of them. There's also a collection in the Museum of Inca, about 200 kilometers south of, of Lima. And these pictures carved on the stones that are in the tombs of the Incas are of various kinds of scenes. Some of them show amazing technology, which is very obvious from that society. It, they, they weren't dummies. Mm -hmm. About a third of those stones are just disgusting pornography, but another third of them show dinosaurs on them, and very specific dinosaurs, Triceratops and Brontosaurus type. The Stegosaurus, uh, the Pterosaurs are all on the stones, and just very specific and obvious. They're still being dug up. We dug up some more about two years ago. Unfortunately, grave robbing is about the only industry in, in the desert out there, and the only way they can make a living and they're continually excavating these tombs and finding the stones. They have 11,000 of them there in Inca, in the museum. and again, just hundreds of them show the dinosaurs. And uh, I have one that I acquired uh, from there. It was a museum-to-museum -museum transfer. We brought several back for our museum there at Glen Rose. And people can come look at them, or they can look at pictures of them on our website. That's www.bible.ca forward slash tracks and uh, you can go there and click on the dinosaur art and you can see the figurines from a combo uh, the ceramic figurines of dinosaurs as well as the burial stones from peru uh, yeah, let, let me stop you right now the burial stones from peru what do those date back to well they're carvings on a rock uh, you know the age of the rock is immaterial to the carving and that's rather difficult. Uh, there have been uh, investigations of the stuff in the grooves by University of Bonn, and they indicated that the patina and the material in the grooves indicate that they are thousands, but they have difficulty getting very specific. If they're more than 200 years old, then we have a significant problem with the story told in the textbooks. But they're continually being dug up with the pottery and with the grave cloths that are dated at about 2,500 years ago. Okay. In these examples here that we've talked about, you've found instances of where people at some point in the past have drawn dinosaurs because they have knowledge of them. Is there any other type of evidence where 
we have dinosaurs and men together, any type of footprints or things of that nature? Absolutely. Um, one of the most dramatic examples is near LaSalle, Utah, where we found uh, examples of ten uh, individuals, not complete skeletons, but at least parts of ten different individuals in the Dakota Sandstone, which is uh, a formation that's found at Dinosaur National Monument, for example, famous for its dinosaurs. This is the lower Cretaceous, supposed to be about 140 million years old. Humans supposed to be a couple of million, maybe. Uh, and so obviously they shouldn't be in 140 million year old strata. Well, I don't think it's that old, but let's play the game their way to see how it comes out. It's in the layer where you find dinosaurs and 10 different individuals, and it's 50 feet down in the Dakota Sandstone. Now, you find this kind of thing fairly often. But invariably, they'll say this is an intrusional burial. It's been eroded, redeposited, it fell down a crack. Or, you know. But this is 50 feet down. It's uh, where there was a copper mine, and they had come down 50 feet into the hard rock with bulldozers. In fact, they had begun in the 30s at this point, had reached a layer that was so hard it was tearing up their equipment, the bulldozers, and so they stopped and began again in the 70s. And the first two were found in the early 70s. In the, the 90s, we found a number of others, and now we have a total of 10. There were four females, and then uh, there was one infant. The rest were males. Of normal-sized individuals, they were replaced with malachite, and so we, we affectionately call him Malachite Man. Mm -hmm. Malachite is a mineral associated with copper that's being mined there. And uh, the replacement can happen relatively quickly, but generally many hundreds or even a thousand years to totally replace bones. Uh, there is no collagen in the bones. It takes uh, probably a thousand years as the general rule of thumb for the collagen all to disappear, and that's gone. Uh, there have been a number of dating processes done on it, all of them older than uh, would fit the evolutionary scenario of 200 years. <laughs> Anyway, we do find the humans with the dinosaurs. We find tracks down at Glen Rose. These are rather controversial because of the implications. Okay, this is Glen Rose, Texas. Glen Rose, Texas. Now, people would say, well, the bones have to be better evidence. Actually, that's not the case because with bones, you can erode, redeposit. You know, if you find them 50 feet down, that's kind of hard to sell, but it's conceivable. But tracks are where they're at. They're, you can't erode them and redeposit them. And they are in the layer where we find the dinosaurs. So you, you can't object to where they are. They're in situ or in place, as we say. Then you reach a new set of objections. They'll say, well, they're carved or it's erosion. <laughs> so you have to meet the new objections then. These have been known for a number of years and were investigated in the early 70s by Stan Taylor. He found two tracks coming out of the riverbank and decided to follow them back up under the riverbank, removing the overburden. Okay, which kind of tracks? These were very human tracks, and the platform there is covered with dinosaur tracks, but these were two very human tracks that were, went back up under the riverbank. So with uh, a lot of elbow grease, <laughs> a lot of help, uh, pry bars, and then some backhoes, they removed about six feet of alternating layers of clay and limestone, clay and limestone and uncovered nine more tracks back up under the overburden. Well, this answers the objection of being carved. Obviously, that wasn't carved. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they're in a right-left sequence and with mud push-up around the tracks would strongly indicate that's not erosion. Now, we've extended that trail, and there are now 14 mm -hmm. in the right-left pattern. And uh, a couple of them especially are just absolutely perfect. You can put your foot in it, and it feels molded and shaped. Uh, so within the same rock you have these human prints and dinosaur. These are clearly dinosaur uh, on, prints. On that platform there are 134 dinosaur tracks. Mm -hmm. and here are the 14 right left, right left human tracks going right through the middle of them. Which would indicate humans and dinosaurs lived at the same time. Right. Yeah. You sometimes look at uh, the old man in the mountain, the, the profile that uh, looks like a man, accidentally does. Well, how do you know whether this was erosion or whether it was carved? Well, if you go to Mount Rushmore and you see four old men in the mountain, <laughs> you get a pretty good idea this was not erosion. And when you've got 14 in a right-left pattern, mm -hmm. that's not going to be explained by erosion, especially with the mud push-up around it. Mm -hmm. um, erosion doesn't do that. But they have all five toes in step and heel 
uh, that is with many of them. There are two of them in that sequence that are just oblong shapes, but that's typical of what you'd expect to find with tracks well, in that, the rock. That's an incredible find. Why haven't we heard more about this in the media? Because that ought to be news everywhere, because it goes against that theory of evolution. Well, we had uh, National Geographic came down, took pictures. We had NOVA came down, spent two weeks taking pictures. Both crews were very excited. They thought they had earth-shaking evidence. When they went back to prepare this for publication or for viewing, the, the editors would not allow it. In fact, uh, NOVA did put out a special on it that said there's nothing that looks like human tracks at Gun Rose. Hmm. Now, you can go on the website and decide for yourself. So Just all those pictures are there on the website? All of the pictures are there. Okay, yes. that would be www.bible.ca forward slash tracks. Forward slash tracks. Tracks. T-R-A-C-K-S. That's correct. All right, so those pictures are there. For you to look also, at. in the same area, uh, I mean, invariably people will say, well, we need more evidence. Okay. We excavated downstream, and we excavated the longest consecutive dinosaur trail on the American continent, the second longest in the world. The longest is in Turkmenistan, uh, where there are also human and dinosaur tracks, by the way. But this this was a very significant find, absolutely spectacular, beautiful dinosaur. Trail. We know what dinosaur tracks look like. These are gorgeous, and maybe the best example, well, the second best example in the world of dinosaur tracks. But no human tracks at all. Nothing that looks like a human track. But up there at the Taylor Trail, you've got very, very different tracks. Uh, this long dinosaur trail is, is now called the, the Turnage Patent Trail. For the, Turnage actually found the first part of it, and then we excavated the complete trail afterwards. Then they said, well, you still need more evidence, and so we excavated upstream from it and found another platform with uh, almost a hundred dinosaur tracks on it, but again, through the middle of this one was another human trail, this time 15 tracks. Hmm. Now, the first one averaged or, or was almost exactly 11 and a half inches per track for 14. This one was 10 inches, more the average size today. The 11 and a half inch track would indicate uh, about 6'4", if his proportions are average, so a good hmm. size man. The 15 track trail, the fall trail as it's called, for the landowner there. It's got mud push up around it. Uh, one of them is within a slightly raised dinosaur track. The, the, on this platform, you have raised dinosaur tracks, which is very unique. The dinosaur stepped, left the depression, other material washed over and filled in, and then that infill material uh, became rock and was harder than the surrounding material. And so when they were subsequently exposed, the erosion uh, eroded away the surrounding material and the, the center was slightly raised. Hmm. But the, the depressed tracks are human shaped and are distinguished from the raised tracks and sometimes they overlap. Hmm. And you can see this depressed human shape in the edge of this raised dinosaur track. So where a dinosaur had walked, a human came through and walked yeah, stepped, after that. Stepped in the infill. Uh -huh. Material and, and it wouldn't have been a large gap in time because it's in could the not have wrong. been right. Mm -hmm. It had to have been quickly. Now, where is the second site at that you're talking about? It's about 50 yards north of the first site. Okay, in in the same vicinity. So th those are, are beautiful examples, and uh, people will say, "Well, they don't look like human tracks." Well, you can decide for yourself. <laughs> and Go those pictures to are on the, the website. website. That's okay. right. <laughs> Go look. <laughs> You can order videos. You can also watch a video of the presentation that describes this in detail if you have real player that's there on the website. But I think you have all kinds of evidence uh, in, in terms of the petroglyphs, of the dinosaur figurines from Peru and in Mexico. You have human tracks there at Glen Rose. You have human tracks in Turkmenistan. This was reported by Pravda and by the head of the Department of Geology at the University of Turkmenistan. Where exactly is that? Well, the site is six miles from Afghanistan. Hmm. We were supposed to have been there this spring that uh, the head of the department was going to take us to that site. We got all of our visas, all of our permits from the government. When the government found out we were coming, they fired the head of the department. He'd been there for 20 years. He's hmm. now in Kazakhstan. Uh, he did say he was he would sneak us across the border if we wanted to, <laughs> six miles from Afghanistan. We decided we we're going to postpone that a while. <laughs> uh, but we, uh, I've got the visa; it's ready. 
Uh, we hope to do that before too long. In Antelope Springs, Utah, you have examples of human tracks, and this is in the lowest layer, the Cambrian, with trilobites embedded in the heel. And we have uh, one of those tracks at our museum there at Glen Rose, Texas. In New Mexico, up in the uh, Robletheus Mountains, not too far from White Sands, up at about 8,000 feet, we have some beautiful examples of human tracks. This in the Permian, which is the layer below the one at Glen Rose with the dinosaurs. And so you have numbers of examples of these. They're, they're not unique, but if you have the religion of naturalism, uh, you're just not going to talk about what refutes it. And that's what dominates in our schools today. And if you want to keep your job, you kowtow to the, to the ones who have the ruling religion. And that's not a bad description of what is the real situation in our schools today. Well, that's a shame because there's all this evidence out there that you spoke of, for instance, that people need to know about. Otherwise, they're going to think that dinosaurs lived long before humans and not at the same time. Right. Just the next time you hear millions and millions of years ago, no human ever saw these, you know, ask the question, a good scientific question. Why? Why do you believe that? Because it's just and an assumption. When people ask me why, I can give you an answer. Mm-hmm. I can show you. And uh, look, you can look at the pictures. I've been there. I've looked at it. I took the pictures myself on the website. <laughs> and I do lecture on college campuses all across the country, and it's really interesting to hear the responses. I was lecturing at the State University up in Tennessee and showed these pictures uh, there at Glen Rose. And this was before we had the second trail. But... Very clear. Uh, one in particular is just as as clear as, as you know, all five toes, instep and heel, are clear in the edge of a dinosaur track. We presented this to the senior geology students, and then asked they wanted to turn around and ask the head of the department, "What what did he think about this?" And he said, "Well, we don't know that there weren't dinosaurs back there with human feet." <laughs> And I thought a minute. I said, well, I guess that's true. We don't. Know. We also don't know there weren't humans back there with dinosaur feet. Wouldn't that make about as much sense? Wouldn't it make more sense to say that these things look like dinosaur feet were made by dinosaurs and these things look like human feet were made by humans? No, he wouldn't agree with that. I said, well, if, if they were made by humans, would they look any different? And he just got up and left. That was the end of the discussion. Um, Chuck Finsley, who was head of the department, well, he was uh, director of the Dallas Museum of Natural History for 30 years. He's recently retired. Is is I think a friend, and I consider him a, a gentleman. We have the difference over this issue, but he was wanting to display one of our uh, dinosaurs that we had excavated there in the Glen Rose area at the Dallas Museum of Natural History, and he came down to talk to us, and we showed him the tracks, and he got a little upset. And, said he'd have to think about that and he came back to try to talk to us again and he actually the third time down he said well Dr. Patton I've, I've reached a conclusion about these tracks that look like human tracks down here he says I think they were made by aliens and he was dead serious I said well Chuck if they're made by aliens they would come from a galaxy far far away I guess a, a, an advanced civilization uh, what are they doing running around barefooted <laughs> He, he got a little upset about that. I think the most honest and reasonable thing is just say, hey, that looks like a human foot. I can put my foot in it. I can feel the fit, and I can step from this one to this one to this one, and it, it's a right-left pattern. Uh, I know what the most reasonable scientific explanation is, but when it doesn't fit the paradigm, they're going to find uh, you know dinosaurs with human feet and aliens and everything you can imagine to try to explain it away. Yeah, had they seen those imprints without knowing what it was, they probably would have quickly identified that as a human footprint. We did a double-blind test at Kansas State University with the site department where we showed pictures of each of these 14 tracks together with just random erosion marks to see if these people who had no introduction or background or indication of the significance at all, just uh, freshman psych students, most of them, what, uh, you know, pick out what you see is significant and tell us what what they are. And uh, Hmm. I think it was like 94% identified them as human footprints and picked out the ones that that were. And then we were kind of rough on these college freshmen. We said, now tell us which ones are rights and which ones are lefts. (laughs) 
And two of them, of the 14 sequence, are just kind of oblong shapes. They're not really, a, but then what's ahead of it is what ought to be, and mm-hmm. uh, likewise mm-hmm. behind it. And so we would predict, you know, a certain percentage. I think it came out 87% corresponding to what we believe is, and it's exactly what we predicted they, mm-hmm. they would come out with. So it's not just us seeing this. This is tested with a double-blind test. We're doing the science. Mm-hmm. Here's uh, Dawkins at Oxford who sits behind his desk and says he's sure those are carved tracks, ignoring the fact they were from underburden. They were excavated from under the overburden and the, the right-left pattern and the mud push up around it, as you see in tracks in the mud, mm-hmm. that, of course, became rock. He does no science at all. Sit behind his desk and say they have to be carved, and we get out and we do the measuring and excavating and mm-hmm. sometimes section the tracks to see the uh, contours underneath show they weren't carved. That's a, another way to refute that idea. Mm-hmm. You see the disturbed material down under the heel, and you know this is not a carved track. So I I think we're doing science. I think the evolutionist is making himself look foolish, talking about aliens. (laughs) Right. Well, here at the end of the program, I wanted to ask you about the museum. You mentioned that two or three times, about the museum at Glen Rose. Could you tell us about that? Uh, We're in the process of building the museum. It's uh, probably two-thirds done at this point. There are lectures there each Saturday. It's open Tuesday through Saturday from 10 to 4 each day. This is just outside Dinosaur Valley National Park. And it's a great place to go take a vacation. You can see the dinosaur tracks in the park. And uh, the best human tracks are underwater most of the time. We have to do a lot of pumping to, and excavating to get down to them. But there are a few that are, are still available. But good pictures of them there at the museum and casts that you can see, stereo photographs. Uh, lots of good evidence from uh, a number of different areas of science that are on display. Well, sounds fascinating. love to go there. Now, where is Glen Rose in Texas in relation to the major cities? It's about 60 miles uh, south and a little bit west of Dallas, mm-hmm. the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Go down Highway 67 through Cleburne, and you'll wind up right there. And uh, Dinosaur Valley State Parks on a lot of the maps. It's If you're on the way to that, you'll see it just before you get there. Okay. Well, who else is involved in this museum besides yourself? Uh, Dr. Carl Ball is the director of the museum. I'm on staff, which means I get to work as long as I want for free. <laughs> <laughs> but we've been working together for about 18 years now. He's an archaeologist. We work with a number of other scientists across the country. Dr. Dennis Swift is one that I work with. He's up in Portland, Oregon. He's trained in uh, archaeology, and uh, we have a multidisciplinary team that I think is very effective in doing science. Mm -hmm. Sounds fascinating. We have a great time. (laughs) Well, we've run out of time today, and uh, glad to have you here again on the program. Thank you, sir. And I look forward to having you here next week when we talk about the fossil record. We'll see you then. We'll look forward to it. 